I want to give you a summary of a session that uh, takes place at several camps during the summer. I've worked at uh, uh, MathZoom and MathPath, um, Texas MathWorks, and also Epsilon Camp for uh, students grades, well, ages 8 through 11. And um, one of the things that I've enjoyed doing is uh, uh, taking some ideas and combinatorics and trying to figure out how they can work with very young students. So um, let me just start with, uh, with this 3 by 3 by 3 cube. Um, I bet you have no difficulty determining how many unit cubes comprise this big one. Um, but I wonder how many of you can look at this and, and tell me how many cubes you can see from where you are. Of course, your view is blocked a little bit, so you can work on the 4 by 4 by 4 and uh, if the 3 by 3 by 3 looks imposing, here's the 2 by 2 by 2. So, after a session in which we have discussed the area model for multiplication, which I think is enormously underrated, the area model for multiplication, for me, comes up repeatedly in these summer camps, and something like every day. So we start with a session on the area model. Let me just give you an idea of what we might talk about here. We might start with how do you multiply 23 times 12? And the answer, which I would just present, I wouldn't ask my students to develop this model. I just divide it, take the rectangle and divide it into four subrectangles. And of course, this is just the distribution property at work. Um, but it, it applies nicely even when the, you have products like 19 times 12. It works perfectly well for negative numbers. So for example, 19 times 12 would be 230 minus 2, 228. Um, and then you can expand that a little bit, and you can do it with polynomials. And this is what we want to eventually make use of. We want to uh, uh, understand the algebra as generalized arithmetic. And so you can certainly see how, how this leads to this. You just, if you just choose x to be 10, then, then you're talking about a, a polynomial. I mean, 10 to be x. OK, so <clears throat> I would just um, walk around the room, and I would each, each student would have his own supply, his or her own, own supply of cubes, maybe as many as 60 or 70 of them, maybe enough for this 4 by 4 by 4. And I'd ask them to think about how many cubes are visible from one corner. And of course, at first, they're just going to count. They're just going to point one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And then somebody decides, well, there's nine there, six more there, four there. So we write down the number, what's 19? And then I ask them about the 4 by 4 by 4, and they might do the same thing. And finally, somebody says, why don't we build a table so we can see the relationship between these numbers? So that's a great idea. We build a table. And then once we build the table, we decide we'll go back. We'll go back to the, to the 
smaller numbers. We do it for a two by two by two, and students quickly come up with the idea that there's seven visible cubes in the case of the two by two by two. So eight cubes altogether, seven are visible. Why stop there? Go back to one. And then uh, somebody will notice that this table, this table has predictable differences. This difference is six, this difference is 12, then 18. They say, oh, let's conjecture that these go up by multiples of six. Now, for older students, for students who have something, some idea about finite differences and polynomials, which would, will be the case next week when I, when I work at Math Zoom in, in California, um, I will, at this stage, ask them to find a polynomial that has these values using differences. And they'll do a good bit of work on that, maybe half an hour, eh, probably less than that, 20 minutes. But then, at some stage, somebody will come up with the idea, well, the number of invisible cubes plus the number of invisible cubes is perfectly clear. And the number of invisible cubes is pretty easy to compute. Great. That's the idea we're looking for, complementary counting. OK, so now we're moving on to the next problem in which we paint the entire surface of the big cube. You know, the whole surface is painted, and now we ask the question, how many cubes have some paint? But we've just talked about complementary counting, and so the youngest, even the youngest students can say, oh, yes, well, if we take the shell off the top and the bottom and the left and the right, the front and the back, we're going to be looking at another cube, a good bit smaller. How much smaller? Two units smaller. And so what we're really getting to is this number, n cubed minus n minus 2 cubed. Well, at this stage, this is a struggle for 9-year-olds, 10-year-olds to write this in standard polynomial form. n minus 2 cubed, they'll work away at it, but without great success, usually. And then I, I remind them that we have this area model and that n minus 2 cubed means n minus 2 times n minus 2. Can you work that out? Then you can take the, that polynomial, n squared minus 4n minus 4, and multiply it by n minus 2, and then do the subtraction. And lo and behold, you come out with, well, let's see. What do you come out with? That. There it is. 6n squared minus 12n plus 8. Do we, see, do we recognize any of these numbers? What do these have to do with cubes? Oh, sure. Six faces, 12 edges, eight vertices. But why the minus sign? And why the plus sign? Where is this coming from? Well, OK, so we, at this stage, we, we start all over. And we back way up. And we ask ourselves, if, if you couldn't see the size of the cube, but you knew it was n by n by n, then the first estimate of the number of cubes with paint would be to find the number of cubes on the top and the bottom and the two sides and the, two, and the left and right. And that would be 6n squared. 6n squared, um, you realize, is an overcount because obviously the ones along the edge and the, and the vertices are getting counted multiple times. But 6n squared is a pretty good estimate. 
And so then you ask yourself, well, which cubes are being counted multiple times? And the answer is all the edge cubes are being counted multiple times, and there are 12 edges. But then you realize that those corner cubes have been counted three times here, taken away three times here, so now we have to put them back. That's where the eight comes from. We've painted the cube, the cubes, and we know just how many have paint. Next question. We want to glue the cubes back together. Uh, we want to glue them together. We haven't, we haven't, uh, uh, they're still separated. So we want to glue them, glue them together. And here's the rule. Two cubes fit together require one unit of glue. So how much glue do we need for a three by three by three or four by four by four? Now at this stage, the students are really into it. They're working away. They're, they've got their cubes in front of them and they're putting them together and, and uh, looking in between pairs of cubes and, and so on. <clears throat> and eventually, somebody says, We've painted the faces on the outside, and every face on the inside gets some glue. That means that every single face is accounted for. Every face either gets paint or glue in this process. Well, we know how much paint there is. There's n squared units of paint here, n squared, n squared, n. six n squared units of paint. And how many, how many faces are there all together among the n cubed cubes? Each one has six faces. They're n cubed of them. So six n cubed minus six n squared. Let's see. 6n cubed minus 6n squared. Well, there it is. And since two cubes fit together using one unit of glue, you can reduce this to 3 times n squared times n minus 1. A lot of students come up with this independently without thinking about paint versus glue. But if they came up with this independently, if they came up with this using the paint minus the, uh, the number of faces minus the, minus the painted faces, I would ask them to describe what the 3 and the n and the n minus 1 all represent. They, they, they need to mean something geometrically. So fine. What we see here is that is a, once again, another nice connection between the algebra and the geometry. In the case of the, uh, the, the problem we just talked about of the paint, what we saw was that the 6 and the 12 and the 8 come from the cube, and that's a nice interplay between the algebra and the geometry. So now we have our cube all glued together. Now we cut it apart. So we have this wonderful saw that can saw completely through the block of cubes. And so we could do that, for example, in one cut. And then we get to stack the pieces and to make the second cut. So um, basically, we need only work with the larger if we're going to cut into two pieces and one of them clearly as a subset of the other, then we can take care of the smaller one as we take care of the larger one. So we um, examine first the three by three by three. The question is, how many cuts are required to produce the 27 unit cubes from the three by three by three? And this takes a while. This is a hard problem. 
And at some stage, we hope, some student realizes that this cube right in the middle has six neighbors. And the only way to sever it from a neighbor is with a cut. You can never sever two neighbors of this particular cube in a single cut. So that means six cuts are required. On the other hand, you can do it in six cuts. One, two, three, four, five, six. And notice that we're taking care of each direction one at a time. That's the crucial observation here. You can't do better than that. You can't take care of more than one direction at a time. So now we're getting into some, some much deeper stuff. Uh, my students will struggle with this problem and with the four by four by four. Eventually, they'll find that the four by four by four only requires six cuts as well. And, and the reason is that this is a power of two. So you can split it in half, and you can split it in half, and you can keep doubling the number of pieces. But what's not at all clear is that you have to handle each direction separately. And so what you end up with when you do that is this bottom, you can't see that bottom formula, can you? There it is. So for many of the students, this is the first time they've ever seen a logarithm, certainly written in a complicated way like this, it's the first time. But this is the answer to the, to the block problem. How many cuts are required to sever an A by B by C block of cubes? The answer is you have to do each direction independently, and the number of cuts for each string, for a, a string that's A units long, the number of cuts required is the ceiling of the base two log of A. And so you just have to add those numbers up. Um, now, next week, I'll be working with the, with the oldest group, with the most advanced group at, at uh, MathZoom, and they will have seen logarithms, and they will, they will take to this right away. Well, okay, so after that, we talk about some of these, I've got maybe 30 problems related to cubes, one of which is about probability. And... Uh, uh, students, students are, are interested in this, in this probability problem. We're going back to painted, the painted cubes. We're, we're taking, taking this four by four by, I'm sorry, let's take this three by three by three first. And we're gonna paint the attire outside. And then we're gonna cut it up, and put these 27 cubes in a bag, randomly pick one out, roll it like a die. Do we have a painted face coming up? Students who have had probability, had some uh, discussion of probability, often launch into immediately the idea that there are four different types of cubes. There's one in the middle with no paint. Then there are the edge cubes with, uh, uh, sorry, there are the face cubes with one ed, one face painted. Then there's the edge cubes in the middle here with two and then there's the corner cubes with three. And they'll try to calculate this probability with all four of these, a weighted average of the, of the four types of cubes. And they come out with one third. And I ask them if that's a coincidence, that this is a three by three by three cube, they're getting a probability of one third. Maybe, look at the two by two by two. What's the answer here? And almost instantly they say a half. Of course it's a half because it's clear that all eight cubes look the same and they all have three painted faces. Three painted, three unpainted faces. So this is a half, this is a third. If we do this huge effort, <laughs> we can get a fourth.
So I wait. And sometimes somebody will say, I know how to do it instantly. And here's what they say. They say, in the, in the n cubed case, in the n by n by n case, they will say, there are six n cubed faces, and there are six n squared painted faces, and every face is equally likely. Six n squared over six n cubed, one over n. Done. So I try not to, not to give that one away, because that's so nice when a student comes up with that on their own. I really, sometimes we don't talk about it at all. Sometimes we just go on to the next topic and maybe come back to it a few days later. I really don't want to spoil that for them. Now, for the high flyers, um, and, and for everybody, in fact, it, we all make some progress at this, I asked them to try to find a block, an A by B by C block of cubes, so that from one point of view, from the corner point of view, you can see exactly a third of the cubes, or a fourth, or a fifth, or it turns out you can you can name virtually any uh, unit fraction, and, and you, can, you can solve the problem. So I want them to come up with some numbers, A, B, and C, for which the number of visible cubes, or in the case of paint, the number of painted cubes, is exactly that fraction. And that involves some factorization. If you want to solve that completely, you need to know some, some tricks in factorization. And I usually provide those tricks when we get to, if somebody gets, gets that far along. Um, and then I give them this handout with maybe 30, 35 or so problems. And we pick out a half dozen or a dozen of them to think about for the next day. And then they'll come to the board and work those problems the next day. I hope I've saved some time for questions, and I hope you do have some questions. Um, I'm, uh, I would be delighted to send anyone a copy of these, these, these problems, I can tell you. So this, this handout is a, with solutions, it's 26 pages long. Um, there's some problems about uh, perspective. In North Carolina, Part of the, uh, one of the end of year um, tests involves problems like this, where you're given the, uh, the top view, the side view, and the front view. You see cubes stacked up from three different, in three different, uh, three different perspectives, and you're supposed to build the set of cubes. Well, they have the cubes right here in front of them, so not, not too much trouble to do that. And then I ask them, what is the minimum number of cubes that you can use to build such a structure? And what's the maximum number? And that involves some geometric perspective. Uh, Lance Cantor, Charlotte-Mecklenburg Schools, go Panthers. Um, you, you said this was for 10-year-olds, and I, that's awesome if, if they could do it. I, I worry, like I teach eighth grade, and I think I have a lot of eighth graders that would have a tough time with just coming up with the functions, algebraic functions off of the activities. Um, if you're in the area, would you be able to <laughs> shoot down to South Charlotte and I, I certainly do could. a presentation? Yes, that's a, that's, That'd be awesome. that's a standard. Uh, I, I'm, I'm available at least two days a week for for uh, talks at school. OK, yeah. thank you so yeah. much. Thanks. Hi, I'm Stephen Greenstein, Montclair State University. You, uh, you give them problems, and you know that they don't have the mathematics they need to develop like a closed expression. Right. So what is the environment like? What is it like for them when, they, when you transition from these inquiry experiences to students, to you being more explicit in your ex instruction? 
Well, I find uh, there's a big difference between the 10, 11, and 12-year-olds I work with and the university students. The 10, 11, 12-year-olds have already learned to tolerate confusion. And they can sit there and think about a problem. And they don't say, wait a minute, you haven't taught us that yet. And university students, I think, tend to, to the other extreme. They, you know, if I haven't actually mentioned that kind of problem, it's, it's hard for them. But this n minus 2 squared, n minus 2 cubed, that's a big hurdle because symbolic manipulation is new. Nevertheless, they know what n squared means, so they can do it without, I mean, maybe they don't have a complete understanding of polynomial arithmetic, but the area model, I think, is really helpful there. And so they can make, they can get the symbolic representation for n minus 2 cubed without knowing a lot of formulas, without knowing other stuff. Did, did I answer the question? I'm not at all sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tom Hall from Western New England University. Um, so the title of your talk mentioned pi, and it's clear from my perspective where you're using the principle of inclusion exclusion, but do you make that explicit with the students that there's this bigger technique you're using here, or, or what? Not always. That's a great question. Thank you. I don't always mention that. Uh, in fact, I don't always bring up the word pi. I did here because I knew that you would understand what I was talking about. Uh, pi stands for principle of inclusion exclusion, not the irrational number. Um, and occasionally we do, uh, at least with the older kids, we do have some follow-up problems on specifically on the principle of inclusion exclusion, often with number sequences. You know, how many numbers are there where the two, where, where certain things are adjacent, that kind of thing, the, the standard combinatorial problems with, with pi. Um, but with the smaller kids, I, I, I don't even mention it. I, I want to emphasize here that the algebra is telling you something geometric. That's the, that's the fun part of this for the little kids. So you said you have uh, Stephen Molinari, Colorado School of Mines. You said you have a 26-page packet there? 26 pages with, with solutions. Okay. It turns out only about 10 pages. How, how long does it take students to, to do all this themselves? Oh, they don't do it all. Okay. They don't do it all. These uh, problems are, uh, start from very easy, suitable for 8-year-olds up to 13-year-olds who are ready for the IMO. Okay, but I mean, do, do you spend a day on this? Five hours, 10 hours? What, uh, like with, the, the with the younger kids, probably two days. Okay. And with the older kids, maybe just an hour, an hour and a half. I will fully confess to not realizing that pi stood for principle of inclusion exclusion <laughs> and wondered for the first 10 minutes of the talk how in the world he was going to transition to ratios between circumferences and diameters. <laughs> Uh, but then eventually realized that it meant principle of inclusion-exclusion. Let's thank Harold one more time, and we'll have an eight-minute break.